It is with pleasure that I now call upon Dr. Gordon Gibson to address convocation. Dr. Gibson. Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President, members of the Board of Governors and Senate, faculty, honored guests, graduates, and friends. I open by expressing my deep appreciation to the university for this honor and will say a few words about your generous citation. I admit to having been a political columnist. Many, many people think that this work involves mere sports reporting on the partisan battle, watching the politicians inflicting great injury upon each other in a contest where only a few survivors reach the top. From this point of view, the, uh, the job of the columnist is simply to follow the game and at particularly sensitive moments to rush onto the field and stab the wounded. This, this does happen, but I think the media have a higher calling, a very important one, which is to provide the civic information, which is the lifeblood of a functioning democracy, along with the context and points of view to consider those facts. And the press is central to accountability. So I urge some of you to enter journalism. It's very important work. My time as a practicing politician led me to think and write about constitutions, individual rights, federalism, and Aboriginal issues. Gradually, I came to conclude there's a unifying theme that binds all of these things together in our society, and that theme is the relationship of the individual and the collective and the balance of power between them. Since the so-called Enlightenment, the Western world has continually elevated the status of the individual. Until now, we have reached what some call the me generation, my toys, my entertainment, my rights, and so on. But the necessary companion of rights, I believe, is responsibility to others, to collectives, large or small. Without the major whoop, collective we call society. They told me it was windy here, and it's not just me. Without the major collective we call society, each of us would have very few options indeed, the, the solitary life of the proverbial naked ape. And some of the things we most value in life, above all love and respect, are by definition involve others. Our legacies are based on the rule of law, freedoms of speech and politics, an honest public service, and a society based upon mutual trust. These things immensely enrich our lives. I believe it is a duty upon all of us to both understand and foster these things because they can be eroded. They are not automatic. The basic tool for managing collective affairs in Canada is democracy. But there are many meanings to that word, and the balance, again, between the individual and the collective is crucial. In the field of Aboriginal issues, for example, which I believe to be the most important moral issue in Canadian politics, my recent book argues that the reserve system has developed an unhealthy balance with the collective far too dominant. Reserve governments control essentially all of the money, jobs, welfare, housing, and so on. And the individual cannot even own land, a basic in the, in the balance of power. There are other approaches. I serve on the negotiating treaty of the Gitsan Nation in northwestern BC. I work with the hereditary chiefs, holders of the Dalgamook rights uh, from the Supreme Court judgment of the same name. The chiefs reject the standard treaty model here in British Columbia, which would establish a new and powerful in Indian government, a sort of a super reserve system. They seek instead to become ordinary Canadians with no coercive Indian government at all. The Gitsan people would own their own land in fee simple and pay taxes and be governed by towns in the province like everyone else. But in the management of their assets and protection of their culture, the traditional chief system would apply the crowns with whom we negotiate look for the standard electoral democracy, which is different than the traditional system for the Gitsan. I argue that elections are only one tool and that the true test of democracy is the consent of the governed. To give an example of the difference between the two, between the concept of elections and the concept of consent, consider the immense controversy today over the HST. Yes, and I won't comment on the merits. Yes, the new tax regime is being imposed by an elected government, no question. But there's also no question that it does not enjoy the essential consent of the governed. So to look for ways to lessen the current cynicism, almost contempt with respect to governments, and increasingly opting out even from voting, uh, 
one must seek democratic reform in the mainstream society for getting closer to that consent of government and for getting that on a continuing basis rather than just at election time. How to make things better? Obvious examples include habits of genuine consultation, which it is mostly not, greater power for the ordinary MP or MLA, which is the only person you and I elect, better committee structures, more muscular freedom of information laws, but they all involve a greater trust in the people and their representatives. Would such trust be well-placed? Everyone knows the lighter portrait of the public, more interested in hockey and celebrities than in public policy. In 2002, the government of British Columbia asked me to design a citizen's assembly on electoral reform with genuine powers to recommend a referendum on a constitutional matter. In discussing my terms of reference came the question, how to choose such a group? It was agreed that an appointed assembly would not have legitimacy, but that an elected assembly would simply be a rerun of the polarized politics of British Columbia. So we settled on an assembly selected at random, like a jury. I, I remember worrying about this. On the ferry on the way back from Victoria, I walked around the ship. I looked closely at the hundreds of ordinary people such a random process would select. Few of them looked like they would relish a year of weekends spent considering electoral systems. Would this idea work? Well, it did, and it worked superbly. The ordinary people rose to the occasion, well-briefed, well-discussed. They gave a great report, which garnered the support of 58% of British Columbians. In the right conditions, you could absolutely trust the people. What more can I say for those of you who graduate today? What may be helpful, because you are mostly young, is to underline some virtues that come only with age, if at all. I name three. The first is respect. If you will respect others at all times and seek to understand them, you will never go wrong. The second is humility, a word mentioned earlier today. We are never as smart as we would like to be. There's always a chance we might be wrong. Have an open mind to other ideas, and the front of the mind is a good place to keep that thought. The final virtue, and the one that may say the most about your life's happiness, is the ability to trust and even to love. As to trust, it is as important to be true to others as to yourself. As to love, it is a dangerous thing because you become vulnerable. You may be disappointed, but carry on and more so for not to give of yourselves and to love is not to really live. That is all I have to say. I thank you again for the honor of this degree and for your attention.